My name is Karen Osland, and I'm an associate professor of history at Towson University in Maryland, near Baltimore. And I've been working here at the Rachel Carson Center for Environment and Society on a project entitled Survival and Adaptation, Modern and Traditional Whaling in the Arctic. It focuses on the long 19th century, so from the end of the 18th century to about 1920. The chief economic reason why anybody would want to go to the Arctic during this time period, the long 19th century, was to catch whales and to process them for whale oil, for heating and for lighting cities. Once whalers get there, they don't just catch whales, they do all sorts of things. They catch seals. Seal oil is exactly the same economically from their perspective as whale oil. But they also have to live in the Arctic. So what this means is whalers have an impact on reindeer populations, on caribou populations, on muskox populations, on smaller Arctic animals like fox. Um, and this environmental impact of whalers has never really been studied in this way. We have focused very much on whales, but we haven't really considered what the total animal management picture looks like in the Arctic. And that's one of the things I'm, I'm aiming to do here. I also, of course, want to look very closely. This is where the Knowledge Society is part of my project comes in. I want to look at very closely at the exchanges between the whalers coming in the Western whaling boats, the American and the Scottish whaling ships, uh, and the indigenous people. So the title of my project has modern and traditional whaling within it. And to illustrate what I mean, I'd like to talk about the Hudson Bay area of, of Canada. Okay. So here we have American and Scottish whaling boats coming up to the Hudson Bay and they're wintering over for 18 months. What starts happening around 1851 is that these whaling boats are now there for a significant amount of time that they meet the Inuit hunters who are also whalers and have been for millennium and have their own very, very different ways of hunting whales. They want things from the whalers. They want rifles, they want bullets, they want better, better hunting tools, they want, they want a different kind of technology that makes their hunting easier. And the whalers also need something from the indigenous people. They need knowledge of the country. The Inuit know where to hunt. They're much better at hunting the meat that the whalers need to sustain themselves through the winter. They're better at hunting caribou. They're better at hunting fox, uh, reindeer, musk ox. So they really join together. This is where the hybridity comes in. But it's a relationship of duration that changes both cultures. The western whalers would not be able to be there. They would not be able to hunt bowhead whales in the numbers that they did having the environmental impact that they did without the Inuit hunters, and obviously the introduction of guns, uh, bullets, uh, alcohol, uh, tobacco, is going to have a very significant impact on a native society. The environmental impact of these whaling ships in the Arctic was really huge. Even if you have not so very many whalers coming up, you know, a small number of people can make a significant environmental impact. We know, for example, um, in the Eastern Arctic, during the period that I'm studying, we have something on the order of 18,000 bowhead whales being killed. It's very important today to do research on whaling because whales are, for the international community, a very important symbol of global environmental health. And in order to save the whales, we have to know from what are we saving the whales? What has happened to the whales? What, what happened to them? What did we do to them as a species?